cyber crime session. Um, my name is Robert Lockin. Um, I'm the executive director of operations and performance of the SRA. But you're not going to hear much from me today. I'm going to introduce the, the panel that are going to um, uh, talk through some, some issues and, and some, some tips and, and hopefully some insights into tackling cybercrime. So we're going to hear from uh, Paul, um, Paul Hastings, our uh, director uh, of uh, our thematic team. We're then going to hear from uh, Rachel, um, Rachel Clements, who's a regulatory manager, who's going to talk about some of the case studies um, and some examples of cases that we've dealt with as a regulator around cybercrime. And then we're going to turn to Michelle Rosen, who is a co uh, one of our firms, um, who's going to talk about her personal experiences of dealing with uh, cybercrime within her firm. And then um, on to uh, James van der Burr, who's going to talk about um, um, some of the work that they've been doing at DLA Piper. So before I do that, when I walked down, I noticed everybody was on their phone. Nobody was talking to anybody. Everybody was on their phone catching up on emails. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do um, a quiz using the app. So can I ask everybody to open up the app? Um, <clears throat> and I shall do the same. Okay. So if I can ask you um, to go to um, the live polls, and we're gonna, I'm going to ask you some questions. We're going to get the answers to these at the end. We're going to see what everybody uh, voted. Um, but the idea is to get a feel for the kind of cyber readiness within the room uh, this afternoon. And I've got the results from the morning session, so our aim is for you to beat the morning session. Um, so first question, um, I think it's come up. So um, what is the most likely, um, what is most likely to be hacked into in a firm systems, um, or who is most likely to hack into a firm system? So if you can answer that. I'm answering, but obviously I know the answers. So um, next, if you press send, it takes about 45 seconds to go through to the next question. And it's now gone through. So the next question is, here's one for you. What is water holding attack? What is a water holding attack? Does anybody know? OK, so have a go at one of those answers on there. Okay, and then press send. And it should then flick up the next question. Okay, so I think it's jumped to the last question, actually. Um, did anybody have the spyware question? Did that come up? So you've done that. Great, okay. Um, I think I must have pressed it quickly. So the last question is... 43% um, of cyber attacks are made against what type of firms, if you could fill those on. So the, the idea of this is to kind of gauge the cyber awareness within the room. We're going to come back at the end and have a look at some of the responses to see how you've got on. Okay, so what I'm going to do first of all is just do a very quick rundown of some of the stuff we're doing at the SRA around cybercrime. Really just talk about very quickly what's changed in our views in, in terms of the cyber world. Um, uh, what's coming um, and what's the latest advice? Very quickly, and then we're going to get into some, some actual um, um, information about what's going on on the ground in some of the work that we've been doing. So, first of all, in terms of cybercrime, I think what we'd say and, and what we're seeing is nothing, not, not a lot is actually changing. We're still seeing, as Clive said, he see, saw Brexit last year, seeing Brexit again. We saw, I was up here talking about cybercrime last year, the year before, I'm talking about it again. Cybercrime remains a big issue. What we are seeing, though, is more sophistication. Um, and actually, interestingly, Paul talked about AI earlier on. Um, and some of the stuff coming through in terms of that sophistication, an example that we've, we've, we've been made aware of, a case that I think is, has been publicly talked about, um, is where, where cyber criminals are starting to mimic voices. So we have the Friday afternoon fraud, we have the um, phone calls being made saying change account details. Um, what we're hearing about now is potentially uh, cyber criminals using AI for those sort of um, um, things. So mimicking voices, putting ticks, you know, mimicking the ticks in voices. So what we're seeing is more sophistication coming through, and it, it clearly is about remaining vigilant about those those changes. We, we continue to see email modification as the biggest issue that we get reports on. So email modification remains the same. Well, the good news, though, is that is starting re to reduce. And whereas previously it was about 80% of the, the, the types of issues we saw, it's around about 50% of the type of cyber 
um, issues that we see coming through now. So firms are getting used to dealing with uh, email modification issues and have put in place steps to, to deal with those. Residential conveyancing remains the biggest area that we have risk. Clearly, the transaction of money um, is, is the big issue there. And it's not to say that other areas are not affected, but the vast majority of issues we deal with are around uh, residential conveyancing type issues. Um, in terms of the size of loss, the size of cyber attack, the reports we get on average, so about £60,000 is the average sort of loss that's reported to us, um, certainly over the last year, um, that's, that's what we would have seen. Um, what we'd say as well, and we're going to hear some of the case studies in a minute, um, that it's not just um, the actual loss of money, it's the impact on the firm, so the loss productivity time, the lost time for the business in terms of dealing with the situation, but also clearly the impact on, you, on your reputation and the impact on individual clients. And we've heard some fairly horrific stories um, of, of those sort of issues happening. Um, and last thing to say, in terms of our wider research about that around this area, we're not the only ones, legal firms are not the only ones being affected by this. The general research is suggesting that on average firms across the, across the country are losing about £4,000 a year um, from cyber attacks of some sort. And I mean, that's averaged out, so some clearly are having more. And some of the larger organisations are seeing up to £22,000 um, being taken. We did hear about one particular example of a, of a, um, a shipping company, which you may have heard about, um, that basically had a ransomware attack. Um, it shut down the organisation for about 30 days. They ended up replacing 35,000 computers within the organization and the 1,100 servers. Um, and obviously a massive impact on that organization. But interestingly on that one, um, had that organization failed, it would have had a massive knock-on effect for the economic well-being of, 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 of all the economies um, in the world because of the size of that attack. Now clearly we're not dealing with things like that, but it just shows the, the, these, these things are becoming more sophisticated. What we're going to do now is um, I'm going to hand over to, um, first of all, to Paul Hastings, who's going to talk about some of the thematic work we've been doing on this. So we've gone out and done a project looking at some of the issues around uh, cyber. And then we're going to talk to Rachel about some of the examples of cases that we've actually seen. Paul. <coughs> Thank you, Robert. Yeah, as Robert said, I'm the head of the thematic team at the SRA. Um, for those who aren't aware, the thematic team, we undertake proactive reviews of high-risk or important areas. So historically, we've done uh, reviews and projects looking at asylum, conveyancing, anti-money laundering. And I think the fact we've conducted a thematic review of cybercrime shows the importance that we regard this risk to the sector. So what we do as part of thematic review is we went out and visited 40 firms. Now these firms are all firms that have been subjected to a cybercrime attack over the last three years. So we really wanted to understand the impacts on those firms and the actions they took to mitigate the risk going forward. Now the actual thematic report is being drafted as we speak and won't be actually released until the beginning of next year. So I'm just gonna give you a, a very quick sneak preview of some of the key things we found out during our visits to firms. I think the first thing to point out is actually going and speaking to firms was the sheer volume of cyber attacks that are happening every day. As an organization, we only receive about 150 reports of cyber crime attacks, but actually by speaking to firms, speaking to the fee owners, speaking to the owners, it's quite clear that on a daily basis, people are receiving cyber crime attacks. In fact, two of the firms we saw, just between those two firms, they had 600 attempted cybercrime attacks over the last three-year period. Now, obviously, the vast majority of attacks aren't successful, but it is a real-life issue. Of the firms we saw, 77% of them had been successfully attacked by fraudsters. So it is a real issue the US solicitors are facing. I think one of the other key findings we found, which kind of opening to me was actually the sheer volume of money involved as well. So of, from 23 firms, they'd had just over £4 million of client money stolen through these cybercrime attacks. So that equates about £180,000 per firm. 
Now, as you're aware, one of your obligations is, is to replace those client monies immediately. So if you're thinking about your own firm, think about if you did have a cybercrime attack, you did lose the average of 180,000, where would you find the money to replace it straight away? What impact would that have on you as a business? Now, as you'll see, the majority of funds stolen is replaced by the insurance companies. But again, I'm sure all of the people in this room are aware that insurance companies aren't charitable organisations. They will be looking to recoup those funds. Inevitably, as law firms, you'll be paying through that for increased premiums, increased excesses. So it's important as a sector we do address this risk. As Robert touched on as well, it's not just about the financial impacts either for you or your clients. Data theft is also a big issue. It's something which is, you know, makes solicitors attractive to cyber criminals, not just the client funds you have, but the valuable information you hold on your clients. And that's something clients are just as concerned about. And again, the non-financial costs to you as a business are also important. The time, effort in putting these things right, the reputational damage it can have on you if you are a victim of one of these attacks and people do lose money or they do lose data. And not forgetting the emotional impact. And Rachel will talk about that a bit later, about two firms, the impact it had on them personally in trying to deal with these situations. The other key thing we found out from our review is the importance of people in all of this and your staff. I think it's quite easy just to regard cybercrime as a technology-based issue. We tend to think of it as high-tech scams, idea of IT boffins, big organised crime groups undertaking these type of very sophisticated attacks. And while those things may feature, the most common link is always people. It will be somebody in your firm who will send data to the wrong person, who will click on that email link which leads to some sort of malware attack, or who transfers money to the wrong bank account. So when we went and saw these firms, having really good policies and controls is critical. And the way I kind of view it is if you've got policies, that's how you're telling your people what you want them to do. The controls about how you make them do it and also how you check what you've asked is being done. So obviously you're all here, you're interested in cybercrime, you listen to us speak. Think about it while you're not in your office now, who's back at the office managing that risk on your behalf? So can I just ask you to put your hand up, how many of you people know what Cyber Essentials Plus certification is? Fair, fair few of you. How many of you have this certification? Quite a proportion and less. So for those who aren't aware, um, Cyber Essentials Plus is a scheme which is sponsored by the government. It provides you some tips and advice Lots of information available is free to you, so it's a resource you can get some free resource and help from. You can take it further. You can pay to have your security systems independently reviewed. So it is a good source of information for you to go to and help you to protect your firm and your clients. There's even a list, if you, if you are certified, you can appear on a register that's being certified. So it's able for you to demonstrate to your clients you're taking their cybersecurity um, seriously. Interesting to note that from the firms we went to see, so of the 40 firms we went to see, five firms had Cyber Essential Plus certification. All of those were judged to have good, sorry, judged to have good written process and controls, and all of them had a good approach to cybercrime. So it's definitely worthwhile having a look at that. I'm now just going to hand you over to Rachel, who will talk you through a couple of practical examples from the firms we went to see. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, hello everybody. I'm Rachel Clements and I'm a regulatory manager in the thematic team. And I'm here today to tell you about um, the visits that we did this year. So this year, the thematic team went out to visit 40 firms who had all reported a cybercrime incident to us between 2016 and 2019. So we wanted to know more about what their experiences were and what, of course, what was the impact? And more importantly, what they've done to actually reduce the chances of it happening again? So the following that we're going to talk about are two of those real life um, examples of firms that I went to visit. Um, but before I do that, I just want to quickly mention that 
these following aren't bad firms. These are good firms with good policies. And what they show is that cybercrime can happen to anyone. They can happen to good firms with good policies. And we were satisfied with what they'd done to obviously mitigate this. Um, but you can see from these examples the huge impact of cybercrime. So our first case study is a firm that we went to see um, who told us that they'd been involved in a conveyancing transaction with their client. Um, it was a property sale. Now, one day, on the day of exchange, they suddenly received an email, purportedly from their client. And what they said to us was, with hindsight, they realised actually there had been a very minor change in the email address for the client. So I think it was something like a, from a zero um, to an O or, or the other way around. Um, but the email itself was, was quite badly written and, of course, changed the client's instructions. And it said, I'll read it here. After due consideration, I want half of the proceeds paid into my account you have on file, and the other half directly into my fixed savings account, details below. Please reply me now so I know you have received this instruction. So, obviously, a big change. Now, the real, real client's um, bank account was actually the same bank, but, of course, the account details were completely different, and they were the fraudsters. Now... In this case, the firm had a really good policy, and their policy was if there had been any changes um, to bank account details or instructions, that they would call the client for verbal confirmation to check these were correct. And an employee, Julie, did this and contacted the client straight away to check. So that's good. Um, but unfortunately, in this situation, when they contacted the client, the client was really busy. She was packing, ready for moving day. She didn't have her account details to hand anyway. And... The, the end of it was that she told the firm, look, just get on with it. Now, the employee in this case, perhaps slightly flustered, unfortunately did just that. He did just get on with that, and he made a payment of £400,000, so no small amount, um, directly to the fraudster. And, of course, never did get verbal confirmation as per their policy to find out whether it was actually the client. So... <laughs> Obviously, this was a, this was a massive um, impact for the firm. Um, I want to ask yourself, you know, this, this is really easy done. Do you think anybody at your firm in the same situation, how would they react in this scenario? Do you think that um, they would feel empowered to challenge the client and say, no, actually, I really need to make sure I get these details correct no matter what? Or do you think perhaps they'd feel pressurised in that situation and do just that? I think... You know, I think we could all probably you know, agree that it's, it's something that can easily happen. Now, how about you? If I spin it back down to you as well. Um, do you think that you could spot a change in an email or, or a brand of something you know well? Do you think you could spot something or do you think that you might be complacent that it is exactly what you expect it to be? Did you spot a change in something that you knew well? Anyone? Yes? Yes? Did you spot it? Oh, <laughs> specifically here. <laughs> so, yeah, we've had our cyber criminals um, um, at our logo here. <laughs> Did anyone spot that? So you can see, so the regulation authority, the regulation bit is an eight. Can you see that? So the logo on the left is obviously we've, we've modified it. And the reason we've done that is to show we're not, you know, if you, if you didn't notice that, did anyone actually notice that? I think that's probably a no, isn't it? Um, <laughs> that it is, these things are difficult to spot, you know, and that's why we do have sympathy for that. Mistakes can happen, and, and sometimes it's really difficult to actually see. Um, and, that, and that's why, you know, it is really important to understand that this can happen to you. So... What did this firm do? So we understand now it's easy to miss. So what did this firm do? And in this case, the firm did pay back the client straight away. But of course, this is a massive amount of money. And they had to wait for the insurance claim to go through. So £400,000 was paid into, from their office account to repay the client. And while the insurance claim was going through, there was also a police investigation at the same time. So again, that took a long time for them to be able to, to get their money back. Um, the client, as well, I mean, understandably, was, of course, very, very distressed about the whole situation. And what they actually did was complain to the legal ombudsman as well. They complained about the poor service that they felt that they received. And, and unfortunately, the, the legal ombudsman agreed and said, yes, they felt that there had been bad service. 
and so they ordered the firm to pay £900 to the client. So that's on top of the £400,000. And of course, as you know, with the, the insurance company did eventually pay back, but again, they had to pay their, their £5,000 excess on that. So, I mean, again, I'll put it back to you just to, to, to make it real. If someone phoned you up right now and said, look, we've got to replace £400,000 to our client immediately, as the count rules say, I mean, would you be able to manage that? How would you feel? It's, it's really difficult. So, you can see the event obviously had a really significant effect. Oh, and I should say also, that it also got into the press, sorry, as well. So, yeah, so that was obviously, you know, it did have a really damaging effect on their reputation for a short time as well. Um, so, in this case, thinking about what the firm did to mitigate it, they did have a good policy in place, um, but unfortunately, as we know, they, they didn't actually follow it. Um, the firm didn't leave it at that. They said, well, actually, what can we do to strengthen this policy? And now what they, they do, they told us, is that they make sure that every time they have any client in, um, change instructions for bank account details, they will actually ask the client to provide a written, signed authorization. And they recognise, obviously, that's going to take a little bit longer and you know, may cause some frustration, but they feel that's what's necessary to give them the peace of mind and give them the security that they feel that they, they need. I think I'd probably also say on top of that, given that the fact that, you know, in this case, it was an employee feeling under pressure, um, some training and awareness would also help give your staff some confidence and um, feel more empowered to be able to challenge um, clients or purported clients in this case. So our final case study um, is the second firm that we went to see, and this was a very, very large firm um, to do with high volumes of conveyancing, so lots and lots of high volume work. Now, they discovered one Monday morning that they were unable to access their systems. So, you know, a scary moment for them. And what had happened was an employee of the weekend had clicked on an email, and that email contained malicious software called ransomware, which you might be familiar, familiar with. Now, this is a malicious code that managed to bypass their firewall, encrypted all of their operating systems, and as I said, making them pretty much inaccessible. So it was a massive impact for this firm. So again, putting it back to you. So um, the ransom request, interestingly, in this case, was very small. It was only $500. So probably was an opportunistic attack, but obviously caused a huge amount of disruption. So how about you? Do you would you pay the ransom in this case? So $500 to, to rectify a huge amount of damage? Put your hands up if you would. You would. <laughs> I think... We would say that you shouldn't do that. I can understand it, but we would say don't do that. It's a really dangerous option, as you can imagine, because firstly, there's no guarantee, firstly, that you would get access again. The, the fraudster could obviously try to inflict further damage or just increase the amount. So I think, yes, the sensible option is probably not to do that. In this case, ironically, um, the firm couldn't pay. They didn't pay and they didn't want to pay, but even if they wanted to, they couldn't because the systems had been encrypted so effectively that they couldn't actually access the emails to pay anyway. So, of course, they didn't. So. Um, so what did the firm do? They couldn't pay, so what did they do to manage the impact? As you can see, the SAT had an absolutely massive impact on this firm. So the firm tried to isolate what they could, and they did do a really good job, um, but they lost nearly everything. They were able to mitigate some things and carry on with some work, but effectively they had to shut down for two whole weeks. And they told me that key staff were working nearly 20-hour days over a long period of time just to try and rectify everything and get everything back from their storage and some servers. Um, and funnily enough, this, well, not funnily enough, because this happened to be over the festive period as well. So it was a really, really difficult, hard time for those people with um, families. And I don't know about you, pro probably the last thing I'd be like to do over the holidays when everyone else is enjoying themselves is, you know, is talking to IT providers and thinking about storage. So it was, it was a very, very difficult time for the firm. And on top of that, as you can see, um, overall revenue losses for the firm, they calculated without any client losses at all, um, or insurance, that was uh, £150,000, so really significant impact on the firm. Um, but the biggest impact, and what struck me the most for this firm, is, is what they actually said was the emotional toll that happened to the firm. And, and I found actually that probably the most moving when I was speaking to them, and they were really very honest about it, which I you know, absolutely appreciated. And uh, one really senior member of staff sort of brought it to life to me when he mentioned that the continual sound of the emergency notification on his WhatsApp group for the emergency IT group 
was just ringing so much that every time it called, he'd just be left with overwhelming feelings of dread and panic and his heart rate would rise. And I think I could just completely understand that because it was, you're just consumed by it for that, you know, that time, that period of time. So, however, you know, obviously there's no doubt that this had a, a, a huge impact, a huge personal impact as well. Um, and it was an unfortunate mistake. But what really, really impressed me when I was speaking to this firm was their positive response to it. They really did think about, what can I do to make this better? It was a mistake, but what can I do to change it? And what they thought was actually that they realised that their key risk was people, but also it's their key asset, and that's what they really wanted to invest in. And so, of course, they invested in secure systems and storage facilities, and they you know, spent a lot of money on that. Of course they did. But most significantly, they invested heavily in training and awareness, um, and they particularly for them face-to-face -face training, because that what they said is that they really wanted their senior staff to be there with their staff, showing them how important it is, and that ultimately cybersecurity is everybody's responsibility. It's not just the senior members, it's not just IT, it's everybody. Um, one of their most salient pieces of advice, I think, was um, they said that you shouldn't wait to have a cyber attack before you start to educate your staff, and I think that's a really good point. Um, and so just finally, I'd just like to leave you with one last thought, if I haven't frightened you all too much, but it's just to say that I think we all know that no cybersecurity is completely infallible, and your people are both a key risk at your firm, um, but also a key investment for you. So I want you to go away and think, have you got the balance right at your firm? Thank you. And I'd like to introduce my, um, Michelle Rosen. <laughs> Good afternoon. Yes, I'm Michelle Rose and I'm the Compliance Officer for Brightstone Law um, in Hertfordshire. Um, in um, October 2016, um, I attended the Colt Coffer Conference at the National Motorcycle Museum. During one of the breakout sessions, the conversation turned to a firm that had been defrauded out of £1.4 million. It transpired that the firm who was representing a seller of a property received an email purporting to be from their client in which the client changed the bank account details to where they wanted the firm to send the balance of the sale proceeds. But it turned out that the bank details received were not those of a client, but of a fraudster who had hacked the firm's emails. On the train journey back to London, reflecting on what I heard about the cybercrime attack, I began to question perhaps that this culp role, head of risk, wasn't for me. I had sort of a mini meltdown. Um, I, um, after all, I'm a 23-year... 23-year, 24-year qualified lawyer. I attended Chancery Lane Law School all those years ago. Does anyone here remember Chancery Lane Law School? Are they old enough to remember? Um, where the lectures were tax, property, business, accounting. There were certainly no lectures on uh, risk, and there were certainly no lectures on cyber crime, which, of course, then wasn't a thing. So 3 a.m. the following morning, I wake up, slight cold sweat, and I proceed to write an email to my partners and I copy in my firm's IT support. And I titled the email, What has this firm in place to try and protect itself against cybercrime? I split the email into various subheadings. The first subheading was 1.4 million lost by a firm to online fraudsters. I thought that would get the attention of the partners pretty quickly. I then proceeded to identify what I understood the firm had in place to protect itself from such a cyber attack and what I understood we needed to do going forward to best protect the firm from the threat. The next subheading was cyber crime threats and cyber attacks. I realized that the first issue I needed to address in the email was um, understanding what cyber threats were. Um, I had a basic understanding that a cyber attack was an attempt to change a PC's behavior through shady computer tactics, but I didn't have a solid understanding of the cyber crime and the various forms that it takes. So I did some research and I set out in my email, um, by way of example, what malware was, what phishing was, ransomware. Next subheading. We all know the need to have in place a robust and secure IT infrastructure. So my next subheading was IT infrastructure. And I set out what I understood the firm had in place at the time. This included the firewall, again, I'm not that technical. So I looked to my IT support who, who were able to confirm what 
firewall we had in place. I wanted to be sure that we had the most effective one in place. Antivirus, what antivirus did we have in place? What was our process for monitoring PCs in the office? Multi-factor authentication, a lockdown of social media profiles, our encryption policy, whether we do patching, whether we install the latest updates, our backup data processes, remote access policies. I also, in the email, set out what we do in terms of Wi-Fi, so we have a guest Wi-Fi and then a Wi-Fi that is accessible by staff, so they have got access to the network, whereas guests won't. Um, I also did a mini-heading, USB sticks, because we, um, I had a policy that we restrict use of USB sticks. There's only a couple of partners where our PCs allow the use of USB sticks. So, um, as I mentioned, I did copy in my firm's IT support because I wanted them to be able to confirm what I was saying was actually the accurate position and then advise if we need to do anything to improve what was currently then the position. So my next heading was what we tell clients. So what do we tell clients? In terms of the next subheading, it was what we put on emails. I'd like to assume that everyone in the room does when they send out emails have a warning notice about cybercrime on their emails. That's telling the client about cybercrime. Subheading letter of engagement. I copy and pasted what we set out in our letters of engagement, the warning about cybercrime. So they're the two very important ways of communicating the cybercrime threat to clients. Um, having addressed what we tell clients, my next subheading was staff buy-in and staff training. As we've heard earlier, one of the most important steps you can take in the fight against cybercrime is to educate and make your staff aware. I would believe this goes a long way to protecting your firms against many types of cybercrime. I explained in the email what training we'd provided to date and also gave examples of the all staff emails that I sent around, um, which, gives a lot, which had given a lot of information about cybercrime. Just to sidetrack slightly, just in terms of training, just to share with you what we do, an induction. Remember, when a new staff member joins your firm, you are giving them access to your network. You train them in cybercrime training. Regularly train your staff. Make sure that staff really receive regular training so they understand the risks and the latest risks and the most common hacking tactics. Teach your staff not to click on and download files unless they're absolutely sure as best possible that, well, that whether they can be. Um, spam emails. We found it a very useful exercise when we got spam emails not to forward them on to all staff, but what I did was we print them off and then I circulate them throughout the firm so that staff become familiar with what a spam email looked like. Um, and we, continu we continue to do that. Um, we'll often call staff into the boardroom at lunchtime. They've got nothing better to do at lunchtime than listen to me talk about cybercrime, I assure you. Um, for example, we recently had our website host uh, in support company in, and um, he told me a horrific story about a company that had been the... Um, subject of a cybercrime attack, and I asked him to share it amongst staff, and that proved it was a five-minute, you know, horror story, but actually it really, you could see the look of the, the staff faces, how, how terrified they were. Um, next heading, going back to my email to my partners, was telephone calls. Um, before making any payments, staff at my firm, it's a mandatory policy that they have to telephone the recipient of funds to, to verify their account details. I appreciate this does add time to the transaction, and often we don't have time, but a simple telephone call can really make all the difference. Um, next subheading was lawyer checker and consumer bank account checker. If that's something you're not familiar with, come and have a chat with me afterwards. But again, we've made those two processes mandatory because they can confirm the account details of a um, firm of solicitors and a consumer bank account um, checker will also uh, confirm the, or whether an a account is frequently used by a consumer. Sub, next subheading was cybercrime insurance. My firm has in place cybercrime insurance, which covers the firm for varying amounts of loss depending on the circumstances of the fraud. Um, I think, again, this is, is, is something to really think about. Uh, finally, um, I uh, discussed cyber essentials. This is something we have recently um, implemented. It was a very useful exercise because the ap application process to answer a series of questions that ask you what processes you have in place and it gives you uh, the opportunity to identify what there is out there and what you do have and what you can have. Um, it verifies whether an organisation's IT is suitably secure and I think by having the cybercrime 
um, Essentials Accreditation on your email footer and on your website sends a message not only to clients that you take cybercrime very seriously, but of course it also sends a message to any potential fraudsters. So in conclusion, um, I don't suggest for one minute that what I've implemented is the perfect infrastructure to prevent cybercrime, but I do feel that I've taken steps and continue to take steps that will try and best protect my firm against what really is one of the biggest threats that we all face. But in conclusion, at the very least, go away and review your IT infrastructure. Keep up to date with the types of cybercrime attacks that are there and that it's a continuing uh, they're continually changing and becoming more sophisticated. Keep up to date with the latest applications there are. It's, um, the market is flooded with applications, but get familiar with them so you can de decide with your IT support what is most suitable for you. Make sure that you have a good relationship with your, with your IT support if you outsource. It shouldn't just be a company that supports your physical, and, and your physical hardware and software. Um, but that they are responsible for keeping you up to date with the latest developments. Something I did was create, an, in my spare time, an IT wish list, because that way I could actually think in my head, what did I want, and then communicate that with my IT support. Review your cybercrime policies and procedures regularly. Regularly update your risk register. Keep your hardware and software up to date. Close email accounts that aren't uh, used anymore. We found it a very useful um, exercise getting a certified copy of a client's bank statement because if you're going to send monies to a client, why not have a copy of their bank statement? It's just another way of layering that verifies what their accounts um, are or is. Consider your processes. We heard earlier about if somebody does want to change um, their account details. Be very clear what your firm's policies are. At my firm, there's only two of us in the firm that can authorise when any, whether it's a, a client or an entity that want to change their um, account details. Um, consider implementing, as I've discussed, lawyer checker, consumer bank account checker. Make the call. It can take five minutes. It can take sometimes 15 minutes. It can take longer if you're calling a bank. Um, very frustrating, but it's really worth doing. Um, file reviews. Make sure your file reviews, once you've implemented the policy that you're checking, that your staff are carrying out your lawyer checker, if, you, if that's one of your policies, that they're making the call. When I pick up a file to review on my checklist is a call to the recipient of who's going to receive funds, is whether there is a lawyer checker in, in, in place. Um, and also consider cyber essentials. And like I said, it's not, um, I'm not suggesting for one minute, it's the perfect infrastructure, but I do believe it goes a long way to trying to best protect my firm. Thank you. Over to you, James. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, my name's James. I'm a security awareness specialist at DLA Piper. So this is your typical security awareness roadmap, ranging from no awareness all the way up to a metrics framework. Most, most awareness programs begin with being compliant focused. They're either due to audits or due to client requirements. And that's how the awareness program begins. As you move along, you're looking at changing people's behavior and eventually the culture of your firm. So this is a typical cartoon which kind of sums up the relationship between the people who have to look after your IT and your information security and the rest of the firm. They view your users as human error, as the weakest link. This is really unhelpful. You need to kind of work together and be unified in your approach against the cyber criminals. We need to appreciate that cybersecurity is no longer just about technology. It's about technology and people and all these other layers of defense. At DLA with Piper, we take a holistic approach to develop and strengthen all our layers of defense, with the core being us, the people. As Paul mentioned, policies are extremely important. But what's more important is getting the users to understand how these policies work. So at DLA, we're looking to create guidelines, guides, and decision trees to help people make the right decisions and protect the firm. So you need to build a firewall, a human firewall. And to do this, you first need to appreciate the bias and heuristics of lawyers and everyone who works in the firm. 
We've been working with the excellent Behaviour Insights team at the SRA, trying to understand these behaviours. Why do people keep on clicking on these phishing emails or ignoring our comms? And we're looking to develop new techniques and insights and share these insights with SRA members. So DLA, and I appreciate we're a big firm, but we've created a program called Be Safe. Uh, the aim of the program initially was to kind of make it more accessible. Uh, information security is quite a dry subject, um, so we need to reposition our team. Uh, more of a trusted advisor rather than this IT fund police, uh, stopping everyone being able to do things. We also aim to create a program that builds up people's digital resilience. We do this through events, and as Michelle talked about, uh, e-learning. Um, we're trying to kind of get away from this annual mandatory e-learning and looking at frequent, short, one minute learning about once a month on specific subjects rather than this huge program. Um, I think the maximum our e-learning is 18 minutes, which is the same as a TED talk. A big part of this program was creating a key message, which is it's our shared responsibility. You can't be relying on your IT teams or your risk teams or your compliance officer. Everyone is responsible for their actions. And that really needs to be conveyed through the firm. So part of this program is also to connect with people on an emotional level. Um, just telling people not to do, not to click on this or not to do that isn't enough. So we've decided to kind of approach it from their home lives. Make it about their community, their families. That will change their behaviours at home and they will bring those behaviours back to work. And finally, the three takeaways for you today. People are your first and last line of defence. Talk to them in a language they can relate to. Uh, don't use acronyms like VPN if they don't understand what they mean. Um, and try and talk to people. I mean, you've got a wide range of people in your firms. Um, you need to talk to all of them. This one size fits all doesn't really work. And you need to show your staff how to take responsibility. And as in Rachel inferred, you need to empower them. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, well, thank you very much to, to the whole panel. Um, I think what we've tried to do with today's session is create a practical session in terms of uh, what we're seeing, but also the things you can do practically back in firms. We're not going to do question and answers during this session, simply because we've got so many people in the room. We have got a um, one, of, one of the stalls, our research and analysis team, are geared up ready to answer questions, and we're also geared up to answer some questions down here at the end. Just going to finish with a few more things, and then we're going to look at the quiz uh, results to see how cyber aware everybody is in the room. Um, but first of all, in terms of how we're responding to the threat, or continuing to respond to the threat at the SRA, um, Juliet mentioned earlier on today that we published our enforcement strategy. Um, it, it, we've, we've been working with that for, for some time now. Um, but, but it's very much about um, being proportionate about the way we deal with these sort of issues. And you heard from Rachel earlier on that the examples that she talked through, firms have done what they should have done. They, they put the process in place, they'd worked. And actually, when we looked at those issues, um, we, we, we understood the, the steps the organisation had done, and they'd taken the steps to, for example, uh, repatriate the money back into the client account and so on. So the, 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 the enforcement strategy is a, much is a very different way of looking at things and a much more proportionate way of dealing with things, looking at the mitigating and contributing circumstances involved. So you, know, you, you will get a positive response from our enforcement teams around some of these issues. We've also yesterday published our risk outlook. So the risk outlook is something we publish on a regular basis. This one, we've been working with the National Security Center to really develop some of the information there in there about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, as Paul mentioned earlier on, is in there. It's, it's going to always probably be in there as long as we've got the internet and IT and money being transferred. Um, so, but we, well, we have got um, some links in there to some of the guidance in the cybersecurity center, but also our own guidance has been updated to reflect the latest kind of trends that we're seeing. It's probably worth saying that there is a lot of information on our website already, so if you haven't been on and looked at the kind of cyber information, there is a lot on there already. Um, and again, we work with organizations like the NCA, cybersecurity, and so on. Lastly, um, Paul mentioned our thematic report uh, that will be published later on, either at the end of this year or early next year. 
the purpose of our thematic work is to go out, visit firms that are dealing with these sort of situations, um, and very much look at good and poor practice, and it's raising awareness. Um, we're, you know, our regulatory model is about ensuring that you are able to put in place the systems and processes to protect your firm, depending on the type of business you do and the type of clients you see. It's not to recommend individual products to you. Um, but certainly the, the thematic work will hopefully give you an idea of what other organisations are doing, and indeed where we have seen um, areas of poor performance flagging that to you as well. So last thing uh, before I get to the quiz... Um, it's probably worth saying there are some further developments coming. Um, we're pretty excited as an organisation about um, the new system the banks are bringing in, which is called Confirmation to Pay Scheme. Does anybody know what that is in the room? If you put your hand up, if you know. Does anybody know? We've got one person here. So, okay, so we're pretty excited about it. So what this is, due to come into place in around March 2020, it's, it's basically linking account numbers to names. So... Currently, if uh, a client rings you and says, right, I want to change my bank account, um, they'll give you the details over the phone. You'll obviously, whatever systems you've got, but ultimately you'll pay money or they'll pay money to that bank account. Um, and that's a number. Um, you pay it, it goes through, and hopefully it's gone the right way. Um, and the next you hear about it is when you hear back from the client potentially or you see the balance in your bank account. What this system does is it's a system where the banks will ask you whether or not you're trying to send the money to Robert Lachlan. So it links the account details, the account number, to the name itself. So, you know, it's coming in in March. It's been, we've been waiting a while for this. Um, it's been delayed a number of times, and it might be delayed again. Um, but certainly we're expecting it to go live in March. And it's something that I think will make a big difference to certainly a lot of the issues we see being raised with us. So look out for that and, and, and maybe mention it within your firms. The other point to mention is clearly the account rules that Juliet mentioned this morning. Some of you will have been to our account rules session as well. Clearly, um, the use of third-party managed accounts can reduce some of the risks around holding client money and transferring client money. Um, and again, it's part of the reforms that we're putting in place on the 25th of November. So I'm going to move to the quiz now and see how we've all performed, assuming it's going to work. I'll press it again. Ta -da. There we go. All right. Okay. So we're going to go through question by question. Um, so first question that we were asked to answer was, what is likely um, to, um, who is likely to hack the firm system? So you can see on here, um, unscrupulous client, disgruntled. So highest being an anonymous hacker. So the answer is a disgruntled ex-employee. This is on the reports we see. So um, the highest percentage comes from ex-employees who are disgruntled. Next question, um, what is water holding? Um, so 42% go for we we uh, fake website. Did anybody in the room actually know what this is? Put your hand up if you did know what it is, or is this just, everybody's just guessed here? So we've got at least one person there. Okay, so it's a new area, um, but the answer is, as you've all correctly said, um, it is uh, fake websites, um, or, or one that has been created to target specific website users. So a new area of development within the cyber world and clearly um, an area that we need to, to brush up on. Next question, uh, what is spyware? I think most people should know what this is. And you can see a really high um, uptake there um, of software that collects data for your computer. And absolutely, that is the answer. So really good, you know, I think it shows people have got good cyber awareness in the room. I won't ask those people to stand up who didn't get that answer. I'm going to embarrass you, but, um, but I think we would expect you, and, and certainly I would expect staff at the SRA to know um, what, what, what spyware is. Um, last question, 43% of all cyber attacks um, are made uh, against what type of firm? Uh, I, you've all guessed it, or some of you have guessed it, certainly 49% of you have guessed it, it's small firms. So, and that's not surprising, it's not the DLA pipers in the world, they've clearly got huge amounts of resource to put into this. Um, they do get affected by cybercrime, don't get me wrong, um, but the, 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 the most reports we get are from small firms, um, and, and that's clearly an issue. purpose of this is just to kind of have a look to see how, how cyber-aware we are in the room. I think there's always 
uh, opportunities to, 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 to improve our cyber awareness. Um, particularly, as Michelle said earlier, about the kind of latest developments in terms of um, cyber and what's coming through and what's changing. And as I said earlier on, it is becoming more sophisticated as an issue. So I hope that's been um, a useful session for you. What we've got as the last slide um, is some takeaway thoughts. Oh, no, we haven't. Hold on. Yeah, there you go. Some takeaway thoughts. Um, so um, obviously, Michelle and James helpfully went through their top tips. Um, but as a team, um, we sat around and, and had a think about the kind of issues that, that we want to raise at the SRA, the types of issues we'd ask you to take away. Um, first one is the culture, um, making sure you've got the right kind of culture in the organisation. You know, clearly, you know, the, the vulnerable person in accounts who's rung by the CEO on a Friday and said, you know, transfer the money now or the deal falls. If that money transfer, you're going to have a big problem. So having the right culture, right procedures in place is absolutely key. Um, people are key, so the training we've talked about and ensuring people are up to date, some of the, the techniques that Michelle talked about uh, may be helpful. Um, monitoring attacks, so, and I would put into that as well, ensuring your systems are up to date, ensuring the latest patches are on there. Um, it's really important that you do that. Um, but also monitor the types of issues you're getting through. Is there any, any trends coming through that you need to be aware of? Look at cyber essentials. We don't recommend particular packages as an organization, but what we are seeing is a correlation between, certainly in our thematic work, those firms we've gone out to see um, that, are, that have good controls in place and those that are signing up to the cyber essentials um, accreditation. Um, and continue to review and, 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 and adapt your policies and processes. Um, as Paul said earlier on today, technology is moving very quickly, moving very quickly in the legal um, sector and it's moving very quickly for all of us not just in terms of law firms but the society as a whole in terms of cybercrime and it's keeping up to date with the latest developments and being aware of that as I said earlier on I was quite shocked by the idea of um, um, somebody uh, mimicking um, a voice so um, when I get a phone call from Paul Phillip I am going to think next time is it Paul Phillip um, um, I'm, I hope he doesn't call me now, but um, um, but, um, um, but but actually, you can see how how these things are moving on and, and, and changing the world we, li we live in. So, hope that's been useful. We were really keen to get a balance of there is some really scary things going on out there that we're seeing, but there are things you can do. And hopefully, the colleagues today have talked to you through some practical. Um, uh, solutions to things you can do out there. We can't give you all the answers, but we can give you some of the experience um, that people in the room have got today. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you to um, uh, the panel um, for, for sitting there and, and for coming in today. So thank you very much. And we're here for the next sort of